Welcome to London and welcome to the, to the London School of Economics. Today i um, got the privilege to be interviewing Yogandra Yadiv. Um, Yogandra is an Indian politician and an academic and has been a leading supporter of the anti-corruption campaigns in India. In 2015, Yogandra founded the Swaraj Abhiyan. And it's a real privilege to be interviewing you today. Thank you. And when I first lived in India, I was working for the British Council. And I was working in a school called Delhi Public School mm -hmm. in Ghaziabad. And I started at around the, in around 2015. And I was teaching politics to young, young Delhiites mm -hmm. from Ghaziabad around the age 15, 16, 17. So that so, would be standard 10, 9, ten, 10. Yeah, exactly, 9, 10. And when we were talking about politics and democracy, there was lots of excitement amongst these young people about the Swaraj Abhiyan. So I wondered, could you tell us, could you tell me a little bit about the Swaraj um, Abhiyan? Swaraj Abhiyan is a uh, people's movement. Uh, a movement organization, a campaign organization. Uh, sometimes they call it an NGO. I don't like it. Uh, we're not a funded organization. This is a voluntary organization. Uh, it is a political organization in that we have a political ideology. Uh, but Swaraj Abhiyan does not contest elections. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would put it along with, say, things like uh, organizations like NAPM, like uh, Masur Kisan Shakti Sangatan. Uh, several such campaign organizations. Uh, what do we do? Our focus is on four areas. One, anti-corruption. Yeah. We came out of anti-corruption movement. Yeah. Uh, we have an anti-corruption team. We look into serious corruption issues headed by Prashant Bhushan. Uh, and uh, we see whether it needs to take a legal recourse or an RTI course or uh, a public campaign. Two uh, is the question of uh, communalism. We have uh, uh, we have uh, a Aman committee, uh, which intervenes wherever the, especially the Hindu Muslim discord issues come up, to try and settle, to try and bring peace, to try and intervene locally. Uh, that's something which we do at local levels. Uh, but two other of our initiatives are better. Uh, the third one is uh, on farmers, Jai Kisan Androla, we call it, uh, through which for the last three years we've uh, intervened on the issue of agriculture, farmers, farming crisis, rural distress. Uh, we've done it via public interventions, several marches, yatras, we've gone to the Supreme Court, we've gone to the media, we've uh, intervened in the policy. And for the last one year, and today happens to be exactly one year of that, uh, for the last one year, we have uh, brought together various farmers' organizations of the country on one platform. Uh, so that's the third initiative. The fourth one is uh, strictly for the youth, Youth for Swaraj, uh, wherein we get young persons in universities and colleges, outside universities and colleges, to focus on issues of education, quality of education, equal opportunities and so on, and employment, which is a very, very big concern. Uh, but we don't do it only in the urban context. One of the things we've done over the last three years is to get these city-based uh, college university students to go and visit villages. Uh, as we speak, uh, you know, uh, several batches of students are in the field, spending one week in rural areas, trying to understand what it means to lead a farmer's life. So these are the four areas where Swaraj Abhiyan has worked, which is distinct from Swaraj India, which is a political party. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you for that really good um, overview of what the organization seeks to do. And to take the first two, um, first of all, 
anti-corruption and communalism. Two things which seem to really plague Indian, seem to be a big problem in Indian democracy. What's your diagnosis? What's your opinion on the state of Indian democracy in relation to the, the two things that you're trying to deal with? Well, anti-corruption, there was a huge hole uh, in 2011-12 as the anti-corruption movement came. And one of the reasons why the Congress lost last election was the corruption taint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the new government that comes, comes with uh, expectations, with hopes, says they'll do something about corruption. And unfortunately, the record of this government, the Modi government, uh, BJP government, has been very, very shorty. Uh, they have not appointed Lokapal for the four years. This is an anti-corruption ombudsperson uh, about which a law was passed by the parliament to the last parties. The anti-corruption movement had forced the parliament to enact a law. All that was needed was to then appoint that ombudsman. For four years, the ombudsman has not been appointed. Most of the anti-corruption agencies today are backed with people some of who need to be investigated by those corruption agencies themselves. The anti-corruption laws have been systematically diluted or put in cold storage. The Whistleblower Act was ready. All that was needed was to enact the rules. They have not been enacted. The Prevention of Corruption Act is being diluted in a way that would almost make it protection of the corrupt uh, and some of the honest bureaucrats who were uh, persecuted by the previous government have been persecuted even more by the current government. So at the end of it, you begin to wonder what happened. So on corruption, unfortunately, not much has happened uh, despite such a huge nationwide movement. Yes, there is greater awareness. Yes, uh, there is larger number of activists, and yes, the country has people like Prashant Bhushan who are willing to stand up for these things. But uh, have, the, have we, as a system, moved forward? I'm afraid not. On the communal situation, um, I'm afraid I have to give uh, even a more grim picture. Uh, because, uh, in a sense, what we are going through right now is one of the darkest phases of Indian history on the communal issue, uh, on the Hindu-Muslim question. Uh, India was born through partition. Uh, that's a pretty bloody legacy to come out of. And one of the cardinal principles was secularism. State shall be equidistant symmetrical, will treat everyone equally. And everyone has their fundamental rights to practice their religion. Uh, state will not interfere. What we have witnessed for the last four years is a government which has gone out of its way to systematically marginalize minorities. Just last week, uh, Julius Ribeiro one of our super cops, uh, you know, someone who led fight against terrorism and has been quite a public hero. Uh, he's a Christian. He wrote this article saying, look, I know and I'm willing to be a second grade citizen in this country. And this just breaks my heart to read Julius Rivero say this. Uh, so in a sense, what's happening is that you every week or 10 days, you get reports of uh, lynching, of someone from minority community. You get reports of uh, some way of some kind of repression, suppression, some act of marginalization of uh, minority community. Not much by way of law. Much of this is extra legal. It happens and the state just sits back and quietly extends support at the local level. And if necessary, makes very polite noises at the top. Uh, this has been going on now for four years. Uh, and for the first time in Indian history, we are looking at a law. The Citizenship Act of India is about to be amended. It's been considered by the Indian Parliament. 
which would introduce an element of religion in Indian citizenship, which is almost a No Muslims Please Act, uh, which has been discussed by Indian Parliament today. So, so in other words, on the secular front, um, it's been a very difficult time. Uh, and people like me feel uh, that the very idea of India is under challenge, under threat. Um, now, I'm not saying India is the only country where we witness something like this. Uh, I guess something of this is happening now across the globe. I see that happening in neighboring countries. I see that happening in Europe. Uh, and I'm not saying this is the only first time it's happening in India. Bits of it have happened at different points in India. But as systematic campaign, with some sort of political support from the top, this is happening for the first time. So this is really very wise. Yeah, that's a very interesting diagnosis and concerning diagnosis of some of the happenings that are, that are, that are going on at the moment. And I guess one of the things that you represent and your organisation represents is the politics of hope in contrast with some of the things that are happening which represent the very opposite of that. So I wondered, what is your, what do you think is the solution? What is, what have young people got to be hopeful for in the future, in the context of this grim picture? I think the challenge for us is to reinvent the idea of India. Uh, India is a, a very unusual country. It's not a country founded on race. It's not a country founded on one religion. Uh, it's not a country founded merely on accident of geography. It is a country bound by a certain idea. Uh, an idea which is embedded in our civilization. An idea that was picked up and foregrounded by the Indian freedom struggle, which is uh, one of the most remarkable things in human history, the Indian freedom struggle and an idea that's then encapsulated in the text called the Indian Constitution. The trouble is that having written in the text of the Constitution, I think we've just forgotten about it. We've just, we've just been very complacent about it. The challenge to my mind is to, is to, is to reimagine, reinvent. So it's an idea of India 2.0. That's what we really need. And I look to the young people for that. Uh, because when I uh, speak to them, I find they do not wish to participate in this. When they hear about lynching, when they hear about that uh, a young girl being subjected to that kind of genius uh, crime, they shudder. They don't want to participate in that kind of India. They look to something better. They want to create something better. Uh, it's just that they are slightly confused. Well, what can I do? And that's where organizations like Swaraj Abhiyan come in, with, uh, uh, with an idea of uh, how do we reinvent the idea of India. One of the things that Indian Freedom Struggle did was that it kept a connection with the cultural, civilizational legacy of India while connecting to the future. So a very, very modern India, which kept its connection with the cultural legacy. That's, that's a very, very Indian modernity is what the Indian freedom struggle was about. And that's what we're losing sight of. And in a sense, that's what we really need to restore. Um, we, I think in the last 50, 60 years, we've not really helped ourselves very much with the kind of education. So we need a lot of retweaking, a lot of rethinking on that. Uh, but I do think that uh, the present, uh, the last four years, uh, would, uh, while they're frightening, they are also open a window of opportunity for people to rethink. It, it would shake that complacency away and would begin a rethink. And I, th I think that's a really interesting point about how Indian youth have got to be at the forefront of any effort to reinvent the idea of India. It seems though that lots of young people that I speak to, often lots of young people have a troubled relationship 
with aspects of the freedom struggle. Often have a, tr a, a troubled relationship with some of the ideas embodied by Nehru. And in fact, lots of young people support the type of um, the, the, the nasty forms of politics perpetuated by the BJP. What's, what's your assessment of that picture? Do you think young people are in India are pro being progressive? Or? Look, when uh, something like uh, a very nasty anti-minority campaign dominates the country, it's bound to affect everyone, including the youth. Youth cannot remain completely impervious to that. Uh, but who are the heroes of the young? people today, apart from the Bombay film industry, yeah. apart from the cricketers and so on, if they look back, um, I would imagine someone like Bhagat Singh. I agree, Gandhi may not be their hero. Uh, they don't know that much about Gandhi and uh, somehow the popular image of Gandhi uh, today is such that it doesn't quite connect to the youth. But their hero is not Savarkar. The, the, you know, what BJP BJP's heroes are not the heroes of young Indians. Someone like Bhagat Singh. The trouble is that most young people do not know that Bhagat Singh was a socialist, was a radical egalitarian, Hindu was secular, uh, was deeply secular, was uh, uh, was completely opposed to this Hindu Muslim nonsense that's going on in the country. So, in a sense, the challenge then is to take the spirit of freedom struggle to young Indians. And this is where we failed in the last 60, 70 years. We thought we have a constitution, we have good textbooks, we have Supreme Court, and we've done our job. No, you can't do that. You have to re you have to keep speaking, you have to keep that conversation up in order to keep the idea of India going. And that's where I think we've suffered. So we need to be. But when I speak to young people about Bhagat Singh, or when I speak to them about Vivekananda, you know, I'm, I'm surprised why modern Indians have not spoken enough about Vivekananda. Vivekananda, is, Vivekananda was a Hindu, was a proud Hindu, so was Mahatma Gandhi. Vivekananda, in a sense, has been seen to be someone who is a Hindu missionary. But please remember, when Vivekananda goes to Chicago, that famous speech of his, which every Indian would wish to take pride in, what does he say? He says, I'm proud of being an Indian. I'm proud of being a Hindu because my religion recognizes the truth of every other religion. He says, I'm being proud of an Indian because my country gives shelter to everyone in the world. So why can't we get talk more about Vivekananda? Why can't we talk more about Bhagat Singh? Uh, if we do, we have a connect with the youth. Yeah, I think that's, that's an amazing point, really. I think Bhagat Singh and Swamiji Vivekananda and maybe even someone like Subhash Chandra Bose. Yeah. These are the icons which really appeal to young people. Yeah, and then you mentioned Subhash Chandra Bose. Well, you know, what we need to remember is that, uh, um, you know, uh, for in the INAs, Subhash Chandra Bose Army, Indian National Army, Hindu-Muslim unity is absolutely a must there. This is a model of Hindu-Muslim unity. Sare uh, Jahan Se Achha is their marching. Um, and they actually make Hindustani their uh, the, the language. So why can't we talk more about that? There's so much in the Indian freedom struggle. Uh, there's so much in Indian nationalism, which is so positive. Uh, and what makes me sometimes feel very sad is that we, the inheritors of one of the most positive, open-ended nationalism in the world, have agreed to look at that same nationalism with such narrow eyes. Uh, in a sense, uh, we've, we've reduced Indian nationalism to European nationalisms, which have been very, uh, very narrow. In, in Europe, nationalism is jingoist. Nationalism is um, by, almost by definition, when you say someone is a nationalist, you're almost abusing the person. To be nationalist is to be jingoist. To be nationalist is to is to be narrow-minded, to be anti-migrants and so on. 
This is not what Indian nationalism was all about. Indian nationalism was something that opened India to Latin America, to Africa, to East, to Asia. Indian nationalism was about building ties. It was about positivity, not about negativity. Yeah. And I think you've really you've outlined very well about the the scope for excited new ideas for this new India, for the historical figures that young people can draw upon. But looking at the current Indian political landscape, it seems like those who triumph the type, the narrow interpretation of nationalism you've just talked about, those those type of politicians seem to be doing quite well. And it seems like there's an absence of leadership on in terms of advancing this um, advancing the this new idea of India with the new ideas you've talked about and with the drawing upon the historical legacy you've mentioned. Do you agree that's a fair assessment? There's an absence of leadership at the moment in for progressive um, for progressive people and for the politics of hold. That is the tragedy of India today. There is not a single political force that can be relied upon to defend the idea of India. What can be more tragic for a country that you do not have a force to defend its foundational idea? Uh, what can be more tragic for a country than to have to choose between Mr. Narendra Modi and Mr. Rahul Gandhi? You know, for a country which had uh, Nehru and Gandhi, a country that had uh, uh, Subhash Bose and Patel, uh, for that country to have to choose between this kind of leadership, that really gives you a sense of how much we have retreated in history uh, and how far we have gone away from the potential of uh, this idea of India. Uh, so yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very disconcerting and that's actually one of the reasons uh, why we are in this kind of a solid state. Uh, but I would not think of that merely as a leadership question, you know, uh, because uh, uh, leaders create movements and movements create leaders. Uh, what has happened is that uh, the country has not really created those movements. Uh, the last big movements that we saw were in the 70s, apart from the small anti-corruption movement that we saw. So, as a result, the political um, political universe has been very still, and uh, in the absence of churning that it needed, uh, things have uh, it hasn't shown that kind of a big leadership. Uh, there have been two or three small churnings in the last 20, 30 years, in the 1990s. Uh, some of the backward castes, some of the uh, some of the more disadvantaged caste communities came up in politics. That was the Mandal moment in Indian politics. Uh, that was a bit of a journey. The difficulty is that that moment did not produce uh, the kind of towering personalities that it needed. Uh, similarly, anti-corruption movement uh, sadly did not produce the kind of uh, leadership that would take it forward. So yes, there is a vacuum. The vacuum is uh, uh, not just of leadership, but uh, of uh, of the entire political establishment. Yeah, and it seems like in it seems like to a large extent you're you're making a very good effort to try and fill that vacuum, and whether it's reservations or agriculture or communalism and corruption, you're really try you're really um, um, triumphing the progressive agenda in India. And I wanted to ask him, this is the final question. I wonder what motivates you in, to go into politics? You know, what, is, what drives you to, to be a part of the political arena? Uh, well, first, that small bit about what we are doing as an organization. Uh, I do want to underline that, you know, while we are doing, we think quite a lot, uh, we are not the only. Uh, there are lots and lots of people's movements and organizations that are working on the ground. And we simply happen to draw upon their energies on farmers' issues. Lots of organizations are working on rights to information. You know, how can one forget the contribution of uh, 
MKSS, National Campaign for Right to Information, on food, how can you forget National Campaign for you know, Right to Food, on uh, displacement, the role of Narada Bachanawan Golan. So while the political establishment has, um, has remained still and has become rotten, uh, there is a lot happening in people's movement, which is what we've talked about. On the other question of what motivates me, I guess uh, I, when I was young, when I was in the university, I met someone called uh, Kishan Patnaik. Uh, in many ways, he transformed my life. Um, he was a politician, a politician of a very, very different kind. Um, I learned more politics from him than from the formal discipline of political science. Uh, I knew him for 20 years and I did not see him lie even once in those 20 years. Um, and that politics could be combined with, politics could be somewhat self-effacing, politics could be principled, politics could be long-term, politics could be detached from your personal ambitions. Those are things I saw in Kishinji. And uh, so in my student days, I thought that's what I want to do. It took me much longer. Uh, then I, you know, I, I frankly didn't have the courage uh, when I came out of the university. I wish I had the courage to give up everything then and start it. I did not. Uh, then, uh, 10 years into my profession, I gave it up, wanted to go to my village. You know, and on, on my way to my village, I got caught up by an institution called CSDS. So what I thought would be a one year stop turned out to be a 20 year stop. Uh, so yeah, it kept postponing, but I, I, I always used to say, no, I will not retire as a professor. That's not me. Um, and um, in that sense, I'm very happy doing what I'm doing because this is what I really wanted to do with my life. Ideas and politics are two things that have excited me. Um, and there's a very deep, connection but the but the establishment of ideas industry of ideas uh, that never excited me. I thought something was uh, very fake about it uh, politics is exciting um, but politics not only that of elections and it, uh, getting into seats but politics about changing equations of power uh, in whichever way uh, whether Zena keeps saying there are at least five ways of doing politics. There is uh, electoral politics, there is politics of movements and struggles, there is politics of uh, uh, doing direct service, uh, constructive work, there is politics of knowledge, and there is politics of the inner self. Uh, how do we do all five together? That's been my urge, my quest. I don't think I've realized it, uh, but uh, I definitely feel finally I'm doing what I really wanted to do with my life. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you.